Yama, everybody. Yama Ninda, Yama Malia, Yama Naya, Keith Munro, Gomorrah Naya Murray, Naya Menegalana, Yarada, Nini Gobandana, Donda, Gadigugu, Bajigugu, Naya Menegalana, Marigigu, Mayabu, Gulamalana, Donda, Marigigu. I've just said a few words in my language. Um, the Gomorrah people of Northwest New South Wales, Southwest Queensland, just acknowledging everyone here today, um, paying my respects to the traditional owners, um, as a proud Gomorrah man, and just welcoming friends, family, and, and everybody. Um, it's a bit of a special <coughs> treat, not just for me and Gordon, but <coughs> um, we both happen to be ex Kofa. It'll always be Kofa in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Co for students, alumni, and um, it's, I mean, I've, I've, I've had a long f friendship with Gord for many, many years. I think I started when you just finished and yeah. graduated. Yeah. So yeah. from memory, because yeah. I know you and Ree and Brooke yeah. and Andrew were in that sort of, that cohort that come through undergrad. Yeah. The BFA. Yeah. yeah. And I think maybe one or two years later I started my... Yeah, BFA here and so, and um, yeah. yeah um, so today will be a, a discussion over forty-five minutes, but we will open it up for Q and A at the end. We do have filming and recording. I hope that's not a, an issue. Um, if this was at my work, I would just own up now and say this program is not going to go for forty-five minutes. <coughs> I will no. try and keep it to forty-five <laughs> though, <coughs> and have Q and A at the end. But um, good, I. I I just wanted to maybe start the program with, I suppose, where our journeys began, I suppose, and looking at the influence that Kofa had on your career, not just being a, a, a boy that's travelled down from Queensland, far from country, winding yeah. country up in the, the, the Gulf Carpent Territory, uh, which is near the NT border, yeah. Mornington Island, um, north of Mount Isa, um, travelling from your country all the way down here to Sydney. What, what, what was those early years like, you know, undertaking? I, I think you were a sculpture major from Edinburgh. Yeah, yeah. What were those early years like for you in sort of developing networks and friendships and, you know, connections and, you know, Sydney being the largest city um, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the country? Um, what was it like for you, I suppose, navigating that space? Yeah. Well, at first, coming from uh, up home, Cloncurry, uh, I spent time in Brisbane. I mean, Brisbane is so much like a big country town, yeah. but coming down to Sydney, it, it was a bit overwhelming at first. Just the, uh, the people, just the concentration of traffic, uh, buses, people racing everywhere. Uh, it was very, uh, very daunting. But uh, one thing that brought it all back was in my foundation year, my first year here, uh, there would have been at least 15 to 16 other blackfellas that had started and almost half of them come through Eora College which is uh, uh, in, in Redfern at the moment. That was, uh, yeah, Ree was amongst that group uh, and also um, uh, Troy um, Russell. Russell and Jason Mumbler yep. um, and, you know, Peter McKenzie also uh, was there, but there was a whole host of, um, of, of blackfellas that were there, you know. So they made, made it easy here, but also one of the primary things is we had a very supportive uh, lecturer and uh, here, John Fitzpatrick. Yep. He was the sort of lecturer that when you went up to see him, he would share his lunch with you, you know, yeah. uh, as well. So yeah. that's kind of speaks volume. But, mm. but also, you know, like, uh, I think just uh, the institution, the embrace of the institution of us mm. uh, at the time was truly magnificent. But, you know, also um, when I, the first day that I arrived here, I think it might have been for my interview even, you know, yeah. I come down with my portfolio and, and, and everything and, um, and I was just meandering along the road there, just across the road there. Mm. And there was Kui Art Gallery there. And I meandered in there. And who should be in there? It was Uncle Joe Croft. Wow. And he 
uh, he, he made me a coffee, gave me scotch finger biscuits, mm. and then he, he tried to get me to join Amway. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's sort of, that was my kind of introduction. And, I, and when I did come down here, I, I was living way out in, uh, I think it was a tiny mundane hostel, I think, yeah. Yeah, Aboriginal hostel. At, uh, and there like was a, a lot of nays to dancers there too, as well. So, so you know, like I had uh, connection with... Uh, with other blackfellas at the yeah. start, and that made me feel less uh, homesick, or mm. it made me kind of slowly, you know, feel Sydney at mm. how it is and, and stuff as well. Yeah. And so you had, you majored in sculpture. Yeah, yeah. Um, but obviously electives, as electives go, you could do other things. And um, did, did you have gen education subjects? Sorry, who? General education subjects when you were on your Yeah, I mean we we done sort of like. Yeah, a lot of uh, a theory, sort of, uh, you know, art history and theory. Uh, yeah. but, but I don't know if general education subjects still, they are yet. So they're, they're electives that you do outside of your major. So because we're at an art school, you had to go over the main campus and do other electives. And there was, I think, about six units you had to do. By the by, juggling sculpture. So Sculpture can be expensive yeah. to, to make. Um, living on a student wage, I think back then it would have been a couple of hundred dollars a fortnight. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't moved much over the years. Yeah. Um, a lot of the, there's a number of early works in, in the exhibition yeah. that sort of charts three decades of your professional practice. How, and some of them are sculptural. Yeah. How, how have you sort of, sort of navigated the push and pull of the sort of the medium that you've chosen to work with over the years. I mean, there's a lot of painting, a lot of text-based work, and a lot of sort of other genre that you've you've mixed with. But there's also these touchstones back to sculpture from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was it. See, uh, majoring in sculpture and installation. Um, well, well, see, in your foundation, yeah, you do everything. Yeah. And you know, like I would have. Well, I come here to be a painter, basically, yeah. and I wanted to do all painting, but as it turned out, the painting department was full up of all these middle-aged old men mm. uh, who thought they were God gift to art and they had this wonderful liquid yeah. and all of us were empty vessels and they were yeah. filling us up. That was their mentality. But the sculpture department had a lot of young sculptors that were practicing yeah. and a lot of young women also, yeah. which isn't the reason why I went there, yeah. but, you know, but I ended up doing um, sculpture. And the thing is, too, the, the, the facilities was really good in sculpture. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, they supplied some of the materials here mm. uh, as, as well. So, you know, so I could manage as a sculptor while being a student here because of what was offered by the institution here. But once I got out, yeah. I wanted to take on the world as a sculptor, see? Mm. But there was no space, there was no place. Um, you know, all the studios were where I wanted to work was on the second or third floor of warehouses or places. So mm. I just ended up doing painting, even though I didn't really have any, you know, real formal training in painting, you yeah. know? But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, in, in terms of, like, your identity in the history that, um, you know, informs your practice, that that's also been, a, like, a I suppose an anchor point to a lot of the work that we see in the exhibition. Yeah. It's influenced, I suppose, a lot of the friendships and relationships that um, are, are dear to you. Um, you know, the, the, the artist group, Proper Now, yeah, actually formed yeah. with, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago now. Yeah. Um, is part of that ongoing, um, you know, uh, history. Uh, has, that, has that been something that's always been key to what you create as an artist? Oh, definitely, yeah. They definitely do shape my thinking mm. and uh, imagination. But also, you know, while I was down here, um, I figured, you know, quite uh, intently and heavily with Bamali Aboriginal Artists Cooperative yeah. in those early years. And, yeah. you know, back then there were, you know, there, there was still some legends. Well, they were legendary, actually. Mm. They are now, you know, mm. the likes of Jeff Samuels, um, uh, um, uh, Avril Quayle, mm. uh, Bronwyn Bancroft, Arnie Femi, um, mm. yeah, they, they were all there. Um, so, you know, they, they, they kind of helped shape mm. me in my thinking as well. Yeah. Right up until, you know, the, the present day, you know, working in a collective with Proper Now. Yeah. So, you know, like, I guess my, my training uh, uh, in the arts 
it comes a lot also from you know my contemporaries and other artists mm. and uh, I always say to a lot of the young artists that you know the most valuable people in the arts to you mm. could be your contemporaries mm. and, and it has been for me because you know like especially you know a young artist that are engaging interacting you know um, uh, you know within the art discourse and also with other artists you know the uh, a more established artists will get lots of opportunities because of you know their CV value and their names and they can't do all of them mm. so what they do then is they palm it off onto yeah. the younger artists sort of thing so you know I, I got you know, like um, Stephen Bradbury, you know, <laughs> I, I got a lot of opportunities that way, you know, as well. So, you know, so I'm very grateful. And, and I always, one of the things I always say is that as an artist and as a person, and I think throughout your life too, you never burn bridges as well, you know, because, yeah, yeah you've got to cross back over those at some times. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so you, 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 you did your BFA and spent some time in Sydney, then you moved back to Queensland? Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, look, it was part of the, 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 there was a sort of big exodus of, of, of artists, sort of, there was this period in the, in the 2000s where it was just like everyone was going to Queensland. Yeah, yeah. Um, and oh, obviously you're able to um, reconnect with, with, with friends but also establish new friendships and relationships. I mean, um, the, I think the majority of the work in the exhibition was probably created during that, that time. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, there's also some artists that you know you've had close relationships with that have since passed. But did, could you maybe talk a little bit about you know that that launch pad from from you know landing in Brisbane and then sort of um, you know the, the the relationships that have informed the, the works that you've created and you know the creation of proper now and yeah. and um, that little history before we move into. Yeah. Some more specific works. Yeah, yeah. What was amazing, I think, you know, about that time was, like, at one stage, like you said, you know, a lot of the yeah. Queensland artists that were here end up going back home. But that was, you know, prior to that, ten years before that, all the Queensland artists were coming down here. Yeah. But you know, in, in my in my case, you know, like when I finished art college here, I was just travelling all around Australia and then doing residency. I was like a residency groupie, and you know, I end up overseas and all that. But. Uh, I had to go home for, you know, like personal circumstances because mm. um, I had to look after my mum who was very sick and I was her prime carer for about 18 months to two years before she, she passed away. And, um, and it's like uh, generally, you know, especially with a lot of Murray or Aboriginal families, you know, um, when a matriarch passes away, there's often quite a lot of unresolved issues and concerns and uh, there were a lot of things that surface, you know, as well. And um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, and, and that, you know, we have really big funerals and, and then the wake and then there's mm. alcohol and grog involved and, you know, then there could be, you know, you know, fights and stuff like that. And then there's kind of this, you know, takes a bit of time for everything to settle down, but, you know, I wasn't, you know, going to deal with that uh, back home. So I just ended up in Brisbane and, um, and proper now, I think they, they, they were about maybe one or two years, you know, set up already and they had a warehouse and uh, I just turned up there with the swag and, and they just took me in, mm. you know, and, and it's almost, you know, like they, they, they were family away from my real family that was charging up all the time, you know, and mm. so, you know, they were like my brothers and sisters, uncle and aunties, and uh, they basically looked after me, mm. you know, emotionally. They just gave me play space, a lot of love. They got me into um, uh, uh, the Griffith University to do my master's, and they just uh, proper now, mm. you know, as well as being all artists and practitioners and stuff like that, they 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 gave me stability and brought me back to to health um, as well after you know the the, the grief and loss that, that that I had suffered. So it's like um, you know they're kind of my family that. Well, they still are because I'm still there in Brisbane, mm. and you know I, I formed a, a real solid uh, foundation of practice up there. Mm. But also, you know, like at the same time, these artists like Judy Watson, Fiona Foley, um, and, and for a time Tracy Moffat even turned back up to Brisbane. I think she's back down here. Yeah. Um, yeah and Tony Alberts, well, Tony Alberts was there, but he came down to here and then went back up again. And uh, 
yeah, so all these other Brisbane artists kind of started, you know, returning from different mm. places yeah. at all. And, you know, like, uh, and, and, you know, like a, a sense of community it, it started happening, you know, with us. But not only that, um, you know, like there is a particular Aboriginal course up there called Bovakaya, mm. Bachelor of Contemporary Indigenous Art or something like that oh, it's yep. called. But there was a whole lot of young Lung Murrays, Kuris, uh, uh, people from all over yep. Australia would come to do there, yep. be there. And the, the main teachers there were uh, uh, Laurie Nilsson, yep. who's since passed away, and Jen Hurd, yep. and they were members of Proper Now. Yep. And it was like, you know, we'd just meander in there, you yep. know, and hang out with yep. them and the students. So it's like, like from Judy Watson to Richard Bell to Verna Key, uh, mm. um, you know, uh, Eugene Jack Carcesio and Gordon Bennett was, al was alive. You know, they were always approachable, yeah. I think, yeah. uh, up there. And I think that nature of uh, just fam family and it being a big country town yeah. kind of thing, yeah, you know, is, yeah. it just facilitated or, or made it easy for us just to be um, mm. an artist in a, in a place like that. Mm. And also, you know, like the, the, there's some really supportive uh, gallerists up there as mm. well, and arts workers, and mm. you know, um, as well. That kind of uh, makes it easy for mm. us to practice. But yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just sort of thinking about, given the time we've got. Okay. Um, I won't go into sort of detail around sort of the the. the sort of the, the, the movements and, and sort of areas that you've sort of developed since, you know, the early works in the show. Yes. Um, I would like to talk about one broader thing. I think that sort of links all of the work in the, in the exhibition, and that besides the, the, the loaded sense of symbolism and the layering of, of history within that, there is this sense of humour, <coughs> Aboriginal humour. <coughs> What's it called? Aboriginal humour. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. our humour, <coughs> I think, is, is unique. I think we're, the, the broader population is starting to get sort of senses of that in popular um, um, spaces such as ABC and NITV that are sort of investing more in Aboriginal comedy um, programs and that. But uh, everywhere you go, whether you're in Cloncurry, Mount Isa, Brisbane, wherever, there, there, there is a unique sense of Aboriginal humour that sort of yeah. threads through that. And um, looking at the work in this exhibition, that, from an Aboriginal perspective, you can, you can see that humour come through. Yeah. Um, how important is that, not just for you as an artist and, and you know, the, the importance of that throughout the three decades of your professional practice, but how important is that generally yeah. um, for you as an Aboriginal person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think generally, like um, when tragedy happens, um, humanity has to deal with things in a certain way, mm. and uh, and when something is so severe, you have to make light of something in order to um, digest it or accept it before you work out the terms of positioning it, you know, mm. like, and um, often too, you know, the most uh, poor, subjugated people, people that are living from pay to pay who are starving, you, you know, I don't want to glorify poverty or anything like that, but they are the people that are smiling and laughing the lot. That's a generally, just as a, from my perspective of the world uh, as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll just tell you a funny little joke. Um, remember this, um, um, uh, there's a band uh, that Sheryl, Sheryl Strachan was in. Um, uh, and here's this guy who was in Sheryl's neighborhood uh, as well. Um, and what happened, uh, Sheryl Strachan, um, he died in a helicopter crash. And, you know, one of the jokes was, um, what was Sheryl's last words? And, you know, the punchline is, um, where's the fucking skyhooks now? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but 
with Cheryl Lars and the band called Skyhooks and mm -hmm. yeah, they sung a song horror movie. Yeah. But like that's just one way that 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 society or culture dealt with mm -hmm. the death of perhaps you know like a, a pop music music icon. Mm -hmm. But you know like in my case as an artist, see, um, even though I'm a serious artist, mm -hmm. um, I don't take my art seriously. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I think, you know, with us too, you know, as within our culture, uh, um, there, there is a levelling a leveling element with all of us where we are all together. Mm. Uh, no one goes above, no one goes below. When we get success, we like to bring people with us, mm. you know, as well. I mean, you don't travel alone. When you're isolated and alone, then that's when uh, uh, perhaps the help won't be there. Mm. Me going to Proper Now is an example of them, you know, bringing me in, mm. uh, you know, uh, you know, to to make make me safe. But mm. you know, like just within our group, yeah. there's a lot of laughter and a lot of. Um, uh, you know, just a lot of sort of bringing it all back into the centre, yeah. and you know, like also, you know, if someone's complaining and 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 <laughs> and, and, and you know, like wanting this, wanting that, or or uh, you know, or even being a you know uh, feeling sorry for himself, we don't like that. You know, we call him poor fella me, and yeah. you know, you know, playing the fiddle, you know, or you know, saying oh poor fella me, Gurinji, <laughs> got no sugar, got no tea, yeah. and all of a sudden, you know, like you, you know. They, they're not going to deal. Yeah. We, can, we can't deal with that, you know. <laughs> but, but, you know, like, often we do things, you know, in, in, a, in a way that, uh, that, that is not sharp and demeaning, but we do it so that we laugh at ourselves mm. uh, as well. I mean, you know, if you can laugh at yourself, if you have the ability to laugh at yourself, then it doesn't matter if anyone laughs at you because, you know, because you've laughed already. And, and, and I think laughter, they say, is a good healer uh, as well. You know, um, it's almost uh, cathartic. Mm. And often, you know, like, I do not make art. I can't make art unless I'm feeling good, mm. unless I'm happy as well. And um, also, you know, as you know, um, yeah. when you've got children too, yeah, yeah. you know, you laugh every day because they make you laugh. And, and you're like, there's little things, you know, that come from my children that venture into my art. Yeah. And look, look, your art practice, creativity uh, in its rawest form, your imagination is your rawest form, yeah. and, you're in the, in the, uh, you know, the rarest form, I suppose, uh, um, and rawest form, bit of a tongue twister yeah. there, is your ability to, to play, I think. Mm. And most artists have a very developed sense of play mm. and um, a very developed sense of creativity. Um, children, all they do is play, all they do is have fun, all they want to do is be creative, yeah. sort of thing. And, and what comes with that is joy and happiness and laughter. And you're able to, like, uh, see things within that make you smile or, 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 or chuckle or, or something like that. And I think one of the strengths that we have as artists, I think, mm. is to think dimensionally, uh, think in terms of, uh, of metaphor or, or, um, or, or, or double meanings or, or innuendo or, or, or poetic, so to speak. Mm. Yeah. And all that, you know, forms a, a clear device for, for people to engage with uh, as well. And often humour will come yeah. from other blackfellas or other people and stories and, uh, and, you know, and just things that happen within our community. Mm. I, I know that, you know, you know, like our storytellers, you know, um, when you hear a yarn, there's always laughter and that gets translated, you know, into art uh, yeah. as well. And, and it's a, a wonderful way, I think, especially when you're dealing with uh, harsh political issues and concerns when you're dealing with the, the brutality of, of a government that mm. still continues to oppress and subjugate, you know, First Nations mm. people, um, to do, to tell of a harsh, ugly concern, mm. to do it in a way that's not brutal, mm. do it in a way where people can look at it 
and perhaps smile first mm. and or laugh or, or, or get seduced mm. into this ugly truth, mm. I suppose. Um, I, I mean, it, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's a way of, of thinking and feeling uh, mm. about those issues and concerns and, and, uh, and, and also, you know, that, that thing again is not taking yourself seriously. And, yeah. Yeah. and most of all, I think everyone's got a sense of humour. I was told I've got um, a very corny sense of humour. Yeah. I remember kept, when, when I first came down to Queensland in 1983, I went to the U of Q and I was studying anthropology, archaeology, Aboriginal studies. And oh. we'd, go up to, um, we'd go up to the common room mm. where a lot of blackfellas were. Some of them were engineers, architects, yeah. uh, accountants, the odd nuclear physicist. Yeah. And we'd be sitting down the yarn and, and they'd be laughing and chuckling. And then, you know, I might say something and which I thought was funny and they'd roll up their eyes and they'd say oh you make me weak Gordy you make me weak <laughs> you know, because my sense of humor is corny or, or silly yeah. but you translate that silliness yeah. that sense of humor into a picture you do a picture of that yeah. those same accountants nuclear physicists yeah. look at it and they'll laugh you know yeah. or they'll smile or something as well and I just say you know that's how it is when you're um a sphere hanging with cubes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I rambled on there. Because well, well, yeah. I was going to say, like, the observation that humour's <coughs> a great genre for people to understand deeply contested stories and histories and perspectives. And we see that a lot in, um, uh, in America, if we're using that as an example, through African-American comedians when they want to really look at the history of, you know, the, you know, the, 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 um, the social justice movement and th they'll use humour yeah. as, the, as the in. And, you know, whilst people are laughing hysterically at their jokes, that underpinning that, I mean, either immediately or on the drive back home or in conversations, oh, they're raising some really important, really hard things that we needed to discuss yeah. and reflect on and, and I think you do that really well, and you have done really well throughout your professional practice. You know, the, the, the inclusion of native animals as a metaphor for Aboriginal people yeah. throughout all of your practice, you know, yeah. and, and inclusion of introduced animals to centre that dialogue, whether it be in relation to, you know, um, uh, you know the, the protest movement that yeah. you've, you've, you've focused on over the last you know, 10 plus years. Yeah. And more recently with the current commission that, that the gallery has, has undertaken. Yeah. And, and something that you've created to be seen and viewed as artworks um, that's sort of looking at that protest history um, um, movement. Or some specific, you know, cases that, you know, have you know, touched on native title, um, you know, Aboriginal deaths in custody. You've, you've always sort of touched on those those specific symbols and, and included humour at the heart of that. So um, I, I think that's something from an Aboriginal perspective, uh, firstly as an Aboriginal, Aboriginal student coming through here, but as an arts professional, I, I think that's something that um, is really important for me to be able to oh, see yeah. our history and our perspectives really shine through really strongly throughout your practice. But it's also a space that, and we've spoke about this earlier, for non-Aboriginal people, allies, and and people seeing your practice to to look at it from an Aboriginal perspective, and I, I think that's something that's also been really key, and it's, that's been a priority for you over the last thirty years of your practice as well. Did you want to maybe yeah you know, reflect on that, in particular the you know, yeah. the, the symbolisms and stuff that yeah. you included? Yeah, and with, with what Kip was saying there, I immediately thought of uh, you know, Dave Chappelle when you're talking about yeah. you know, just the use of humour to yeah. highlight some, some issues and concerns. And, and like, I, I mean, even when watching on YouTube, you know, uh, the, 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 the Russian war in Ukraine, you know, just the humour that, that comes from, you know, some of the Ukraine reporting about what the, the Russians are doing, you know, I'm just, just kind of reflecting on, on our own ways of, uh, of de dealing with, uh, you know, our, our, our harsh um, 
uh, realities and uh, you know like but you're right what you do what it does do is it, it does you know uh, take away that you know like pointing the finger at someone and you don't feel personally confronted or or, or blamed you know, for those issues and concerns. And yeah. humor becomes like a, an invitation for you to engage with our realities as, as blackfellas, you know, through the interpretation of one, one artist and, and, um, and, and, you know, take that back with you to laugh, to smile, mm. um, even though, you know, uh, you're dealing with, you know, the political concerns, but to, uh, to feel it from, from a different, different angle mm. and, and you know like I think one of the strengths that, uh, that, that, that I've got I think is that, that uh, I've got a pretty lively imagination I think and you know that kind of separates, separates me a little bit from uh, a, a lot of artists whereby um, I'm able to be like make light and fun of, of complex things and you know like through my own experience yeah. through reading Dr. Seuss and, mm. and just watching a lot of programs and cartoons mm. and silly little things with my children I think it helped hone um, you know those, those skills to make a complex issue and concern a little bit simpler mm. by using you know a metaphor by using uh, text by using color um, and by playing with uh, um, you know people's subconscious uh, mm. uh, as well uh, so you probably you know a lot of times I think viewers can get seduced mm. into uh, understanding or relating to a painting you know without really knowing it you know like uh, you know for example reading a text you know like I was saying I think to someone uh, the other day is that that not everyone in culture and society you know possess a visual language mm. but if you write text or words on there that's kind of like the foot in the door to understanding a picture yeah. and you know they can walk in and then you know then perhaps you know you know like just by the the color spectrum by juxtaposing um, uh, um, green and red or, or, or chucking you know orange with with uh, um, blue yeah. you know they're opposite on the spectrum and mm. unbeknownst to you your optic nerves are just mm. sort of like flickering a little bit uh, as well and and the process of seduction for you to have, I was going to say, an intimate relationship with the painting <laughs> is, is begun sort of thing perhaps, you know, like they're kind of this little dynamics that, uh, that I subconsciously do, yeah. I think, but also like other devices I think that engage people is just, um, you know, just composition, the thirds uh, 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 in doing the picture, mm. but also like, um, you know, uh, you create even a, like a bit of tension mm. or in the work or something that, that's not kind of right, but mm. to sit there and look at and, and understand it and um, relate to it on the level as what is there. Mm. You know, in a sense, the, the, the painting will create its own terms, you know, mm. whether it's, it's kind of hitting you, you know, in the heart, in the brain, or in, with your sense of humor. Um, if it does that, you know, I kind of feel that, that it's worthwhile, you know? Yeah. I, I think one of the most important things artists do, and, and you are certainly front and center of this, is artists are able to create safe spaces to provoke and challenge thought and and to be able to do that in a culturally safe space I think is more important from Aboriginal, Aboriginal perspective because we you know we know the the statistic when it comes to closing the gap um, but artists are able to I suppose amplify through their practice issues that are either deeply personal and reflected to them um, or amplify you know, really important issues or ideas um, that can, like you say, pull people in yeah. to challenge those thoughts and I suppose offer an alternative perspective which, um, which may not be prevalent um, if we're only accessing you know, a particular issue from a particular media source or a particular um, 
circle of friends or, 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 or group. So um, I know your own history also informs your practice. Yeah. Um, there's certainly references to that within in the exhibition. Yeah. Um, also, obviously, the contemporary issues that we're, we're, we're dealing with um, over the last 30 years yeah. or plus. Um, but uh, how do you think your, your practice has evolved from a, a young girl, Gordon Hooky, <clears throat> You know, stepping on this space, yeah. you know, I don't know, what, 30 years ago now? Yeah. Well, to, to now with the, the most yeah. recent work that you've well, created and that's included in the exhibition. Yeah, well, I mentioned earlier, I'm just internally, you know, grateful for this institution because mm. they honed, I was talking to others earlier, mm. they honed like an honesty or a truthfulness, you know, in my practice. Yeah. Um, I almost had to leave home to find who I am, mm. and being here helped find me, you know, uh, only because I got indoctrinated by, by certain teachings here mm. to continually ask that question, who I am, sort of thing, and, uh, and, you know, through that I've developed a strong sense, a solid base, a solid platform of honesty, mm. which I formulate my practice uh, on. So, you know, starting here, uh, uh, you know, 30, 34 years ago, when, when, I, when I first, yeah. you know, men and ran into our Uncle Joe across the, across the road there, you know, um, to now, uh, another thing that happened in those early years, I think, is that one of the classes we were asked to, look, we're only foundation year students, and yeah. the teacher asked us to write an artist philosophy. I didn't even know what the word philosophy <laughs> meant, you know? <laughs> Lucky someone had a dictionary. But, but anyway, um, I, I did. You know, and the philosoph philosophy I wrote, you know, during that, that week, that second or third week, was something to the fact that, um, you know, um, I position my art practice on the interface where Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal cultures converge. On that interface, there's a lot of issues and concerns that have to be addressed. And I went on like issues like land rights, deaths and custody, health, education. And then in recent times, you know, I've added to it that, you know, more and more global concerns are, are, are entering our communities and they have to be addressed too. But, you know, like, that philosophy changed very little over time. And when I showed Kip the very first work, you know, it was kind of that I thought I'd done here, you know, is quite minimalist. And then we kind of went through and, and, you know, like, you know, to my surprise that, that those works, there, there is like a, a, a solid conceptual thread that, that kind of goes through all the works that I've had and also, you know, like I was saying, our practice are cumulative, so everything that I've done in the past, yeah. you know, is in that, the work that, that, that I'm doing. Mm. But not only that, I mean, that accumulation also sits on the accumulation of the likes of Kevin Gilbert, Gordon Bennett, and, you know, uh, all those other, um, you know, blackfellow artists that had gone before me, so, you know, they inform um, my, my practice and what I do now. Mm. But one of the, the, the key things, I think, as any young artists that are, that are here now, um, is that when somebody asks you what's your greatest artwork or what's your best artwork, mm. your answer has always got to be the next one. Mm. Because what you've done will always enter mm. into this very next artwork as well. Yeah. But you know, like, um, I, I think, you know, since leaving here mm. um, was the, well, being here was the basis to everything, but, but one of the things that I did do is, is travel a lot and expo expose myself to lots of different yeah. communities, you know, not only around Australia, mm. but also around the world. And also, you know, venturing into um, other cultures that are non-English speaking yeah. as well. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, like as humans, as artists, you can only really gain meaning mm. by what's around it, or you gain meaning 
by your multiple exposure, mm. you know, to those things that add to that, that meaning. So it's like, you know, the more education you've got, the more experience that you've got, mm. um, um, you know, the more people yeah. you have contact with, um, you know, the more c clear you are to yourself and perhaps to your, your practice. So, mm. so, yeah, my journey, uh, you know, right from now to doing the history paintings there, mm. see, because, I, I, you know, in joining proper now, like kind of our criteria, criteria mm. you know, proper now is we got to do things proper way in accord with protocol and doing the right thing yeah. by our people. Yeah. But doing it now, make art about now, events and concerns as they occur, yeah. you know, so that was kind of like the notion between me and my contemporaries in Brisbane, you know, and, yeah. and, and we would consult quite a lot. And basically everything that we do, we had to run, run the gauntlet of uh, some yeah. severe art critiques, you know, um, between us in order for, you know, we even get critiqued by anyone out in the public. Yeah. But, you know, like um, then I get commissioned to do this history painting, which is yeah. kind of hard because it was kind of asking me to look back in time yeah to do pictures of those events back in time. Yeah. But you know, the way that I dealt with it was that history has its ramifications today. Mm. History manifests today. Mm. What happened back then yeah. is affecting us today. Yeah. Like in that work, you know, the first shooting of a black fella in, um, in Queensland, mm. the first recorded shooting happened in Skirmish Point mm. uh, near Bribie Island, yep. which is just outside. And that was the first recording where Aboriginal men and women wore lead balls through their body. Uh, and I indicated it, those lead balls penetrating the black skin, mm. creating the blood that creates the red of our flag. Yep. But those lead balls, they continue flying. Mm. They continue flying through the rest of the painting. Yeah. Murrayland too, those lead balls are still flying, you know. Mm. Uh, in Queensland, those lead balls are still hitting our people. Mm. We are still dying, we're still suffering uh, government policies up there. So in effect, metaphorically speaking, history is today. Mm. Those things mm. that happened back home, back then, yeah. um, is still affecting us. So, so in a sense, you know, like, even though it's back there, you know, I often bring, bring it to now to make it relevant, you know, um, to tell people, to show people that it wouldn't be like this mm. if that didn't happen. Yeah. And like, I mean, to say it even, you know, brutally in, in the scroll, when you see a scroll, mm. You know, it tells of a time gone past, you know, mm. as well. And people think it's, you know, oh, it's back then. But, you know, mm. when you read the text that I've done on that scroll in running writing, it's, you know, something like, you know, um, you know, like John Howard used to say, oh, we, we can't be responsible for, you know, what happened back then. It wasn't mm. us that do it. You know, that's my Marjorie Taylor Green voice. Mm. Um, but, yeah, but, you know, in the end, you know, the, you know, most Australians, most Anglo-Australians, you know, are the direct beneficiaries from the brutal atrocities that happened to my people, to my forebears, by their forebears. And those Australians have inherited great wealth. And we, as our blackfellas, look at our inheritance compared to what the very rich Anglo-Australians have inherited today. And there's been no reciprocation at all, you know? And, you know, while that is the case, my contemporaries, artists like me, mm. will continually, see, only megaphone that we have got is our art, mm. is our imagination, our mm. creativity. You know, like there's a couple of works in there that talk about, you know, the, the power, the great megaphones that government have, the great megaphones that uh, the likes of Rupert Mur Mur Murdoch have, the great megaphones of, 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 you know, the rich people. They're able to indoctrinate engineer thought, you know, in great ways compared to us artists. So it's like, you know, we're up against it as, as yeah. practitioners, you know, as well. The, the, that metaphor with the long shadow, obviously, uh, stretches across a number of bodies of work. Yeah. Um, 
And there's also these sort of lovely, and we spoke about this earlier, but these conversation pieces um, um, that I sort of immediately popped in my mind when I was looking at it, a couple of the works in the show as well. And, um, and I think it's, it's inspiring as an Aboriginal arts professional for me to be able to pick up those, yeah. but also ask you about them and sort of have, have them sort of, um, uh, yeah, I've spoken about as well. I'm just thinking of the, um, the Gordon Siren. Yeah. Um, Judgment by his peers. I don't know yeah. if um, people are aware of that work. So that, that was an early work that was created yeah. uh, in the 80s, I think, um, in relation to the Royal Commission Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which was yeah. a, a, an image of a courthouse with a, a black um, person in the dock with uh, uh, the, the, the judge and the, yeah, basically everyone in that, in that scene being non-Aboriginal. Um, which was the the exact opposite to the work that you've got in the exhibition of yeah. um, the scene that you've got reflecting the the court case surrounding yeah. the, the the death of Murunji Dumunji on Palm Island. Yeah. Um, which you know, you know, thirty years later, I think is really beautiful and poetic and powerful and oh, all those things at the same time. Yeah. Um, the, the use of symbolism as well I think is really important and it's something that from, from an Aboriginal lens I, I pick up a lot easier Yeah. Um, uh, because that, that history also informs the work that I think we all do yeah. in that space. Yeah. Um, but I just wanted to share with the audience, I'm sure you've all seen the show before we wrap up and, and, and open up for questions from the audience. There's this beautiful print that you've made and it's a companion piece to the, um, the native title series yeah, in yeah. the background that I thought I'd read out, um, um, which I think, I didn't realise you actually wrote this. And not, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's pretty beautiful. Cool. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. uh, the, the Deputy Prime Minister, Timothy Fish faced Fisher said, they'll take your land, they'll take your yard while you're in your bed, while you lie asleep at night. They'll sneak out back and claim land right. The Mabo legislation meant a lot to you. Gubba terms are dollars, that's true. Regardless of Westminster law, this is our country now and before. We don't want your suburban backyard and spears and spearing you would be too hard. Uh, you may as well uh, keep all you took, but no, no more till we've balanced book. Our children's future in your hands. Uh, don't want that rent. Oh, funny, sorry, children's futures, that's in our hands. Our terms, our law, our, our demands. Don't want that rent to prevail. Um, love, peace, happiness will not fail. So I think that, that really, I think, stems from this sort of really uh, an important willingness for you to, to, whilst the work is confronting for people to see, when I read that, I see a lot of uh, sort of love and a lot of a lot of generosity and goodwill for you to communicate those senses of you know this is the harsh perspective that we're you know sh showing our lived reality. Yeah. Um. And the native title decision is probably probably no better case in point with the the week people successfully um, winning their high court judgment, gaining. Um, uh, so some, some hard fought rights, and then the Howard Liberal government at the time, with all the manifestations and the, yeah. just the sensationalism around, you know, they're going to claim your backyard. What does that mean? Yeah. Uncertainty. It wasn't about the, suddenly the story was about something else. Yeah. It wasn't about the weak people up in far north Queensland and what they'd achieved. It was about Canberra, basically, and what was happening down there yeah. and the lobby groups that that have such a stranglehold over the way we consume information and the way we look at things. Mm. But when I read that, I, I see 
this sort of this lovely way in which you've sort of opened this space up to to all people to, to see the perspective in which you're you know you're you're coming from and you're presenting yeah, through, through yeah. your practice. Yeah, yeah. It's just a you know a bit of truth telling um, and honesty and asking mm. yous or those viewing to be honest and truthful uh, as well. You know, in order mm. you know to make it right for you yeah. as well as us. You know. Yeah as well because um, I just think you know um, ethically uh, there is, is is an obligation you know for everyone I always tell my uh, children they get sick of hearing it you know but I always tell my children when I drop them off at school you know I, I the two little boys I, I say oh you know look after all the little people look after those that are, are younger than you Especially little girls, you might need them later on. No, I don't say that. But, but no, I say, look, um, most of all I say, be the best possible version of yourself that you can possibly be. Yeah. And, and, and I feel that, that that's relevant, you know, to everyone, yeah. to everyone in the world, including Vlad Putin and Donald Trump, you know, uh, as well. But mm. sadly, they're, they're, they're failing terribly in that department. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, you're right. That, poem, I didn't, I clean forgot about that until <laughs> we read it just then. Yeah. No, it was just well. yeah. And it related to that, the painting directly across the road from yeah. it as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's just beautifully written. Yeah. All we might do, I, I have <coughs> gone over my 45 minutes by, by eight minutes, um, but I would like to open it up for questions from our wonderful audience. Um, if there was any that you might have for me or Gordon. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for that talk. It was wonderful. And I feel like having that after having looked at the exhibition is sort of, it's got all the ideas from the exhibition kind of learning again. And I think that um, going in there, one of the most striking things about your work is the affect that comes out of it. And as you were saying um, about tension and how the work sort of forces you to hold multiple emotions at the same time. So I find it really interesting that you said you have to feel a certain way when you're making art as well. So I wanted to, I guess, ask about how you felt when making more difficult works or, or more confronting works, you know, things like, um, like King Hit for Queen and Country. I mean, that was quite a while ago. Do you feel the same way about it now that you did there? Well, quite strangely, I forgot quite a lot about those works. I didn't even know they exist, you know. Um, and, and there is kind of a, a sense of nostalgia just encountering it yeah. and just thinking about, you know, the process or, or what happened back then that, or what were the circumstances back then when, when I'd done this. And it kind of... It's almost going back in a time machine, you know, yeah, metaphorically speaking, and to try and think uh, about it because all those works are, are long forgotten because generally once mm. my artwork leaves a studio, it, it's kind of, I'm, I'm severed from it and I don't care what happened, I just let it go, you know. And, and, and you know, it's quite interesting too, sometimes at, at an opening or, or somewhere in public, someone will come up to me and they'll talk, about, talk to me about an artwork. Yeah. And you know, and then there's a process of cross-examining happening to find out what that artwork is. Mm. And it could be an artwork that I painted maybe 20 years ago. Yeah. And they're talking to me as if I painted it yesterday, you know? <laughs> so, so it's kind of that, that feeling, you know, going back there, yeah. looking at it, and then sort of trying to cue into, you know, um, uh, what, what witness, what is this witnessing, you know? Mm. Um, what, what time is this bearing witness yeah. to, you know? Um, uh, what, you know, like just to kind of walk back through it, you know, like, um, and what's so pleasant about this is, is to find out, to know where some of these uh, mm. artworks are now, mm. you know, um, as well. But keep in mind, like, um, this is only really a small 
cross sections of work that I have done. There's so like you can imagine a 30, um, 30 year, 40 year practice. You know, like um, there's a lot of works that are unaccounted for that is mm. flying around there somewhere. Um, I used to just leave works wherever I am because I was travelling around doing, yeah. doing like residencies, and I'd do a work and just leave it. Mm. I mean, there was stage where I was burying works, burying sculptures, and in the ground and just leaving them and forgetting about them. There are some works probably buried in New Zealand and Canada and yeah. uh, at Art House uh, in Newtown there. I think there's one still there somewhere um, if they haven't dug it up. But you know, like, um, so it's just good. And the works that they got here are works that are actually looked after mm. and kept in institutions and climate control and stuff like that. So, so they're fresh, um, like the moment mm. when yeah. they did take them. Yeah. And, um, and, and yeah, and, and, and I guess they all have, you know, like stories mm. uh, as, as well. And when I first moved, work, uh, you know, walked in here and, and seeing it and, and I had a little bit of time on my own, you know, kind of with it too. And, uh, and yeah, it, it was, you know, a little bit like running into an old friend or something, a little bit like that. But, but of course, you know, my attitude to my art basically is once it's at a studio, it's gone, you know. And, and I kind of rationalise my art, that by saying, oh, you know, all it is is just, just paint and colour on a canvas support and, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, arranged it some way and, and I used to romanticize it like like you know the greatest part of that particular artwork is my process of actually doing it mm. the actual act of creativity that is the greatest part of it everything else is the leftovers or the afterbirth mm. of what had happened so the real power and the real strength of my creativity it's not the artwork, mm. it's the act of doing it. Mm. It's the act of engaging with the concepts and the ideas. It's the act of building up this intense circle or bubble or zone that you're working in there. And the tangible result of that is what you see here. Mm. I mean, it's reminiscent to uh, uh, ceremony and ritual in a sense that happened you know just for want of a better metaphor or story is like uh, there was a ceremony that was done with flax and ochres and blood and spinifex and stuff like that and you know on on the ground up north somewhere there mm -hmm. the ceremony and ritual might have taken a week or something like that and and the like what was left there in the end was the uh, um, just the ceremony ground and the image and everything that was that was uh, created during that, and then what they do is they just yeah yeah rub it out, step it over it, and uh, the power is something that's intangible. Mm. And you know I romanticise by saying that in a sense the mm. creative process yeah. is yeah. the power and the strength of the work. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. yeah? As being very affected by your show um, and studying here, doing um, cultural leadership. Um, what is the one thing you were talking about responsibility and ethics for all of us? Um, what's the one thing that you would suggest would be important for someone to do in, in helping to facilitate or supporting the facilitation of, of positive change? Yeah, I think the, the, the one thing, you know, like for me, um, like I, I kind of can't speak for others, but the, the, the one thing for me, you know, in regards to my work is to be brutally honest with myself um, in my, my crea creation and, and perhaps, you know, uh, you know, the, the things that I say to my children, you know, to, to be the best possible version of yourself that you could possibly be. And, and I think if, that, that possibly could be one thing that, that people could, you know, look at, it, not only my works, but other people's works too, and approach that work on its own terms. And, you know, obviously, you know, you will look at that work and read the work, you know, from your own experience, from your own screens of socialization and history. 
But, you know, I, I suppose, you know, like, to, to do it, interpret it your own way, do it on your own terms, and do it honestly, you know. So I guess, you know, the, the one thing would be, you know, just your, your, your own, you know, ethics or, or your own way of, of being the best possible person that, that one can be, you know, in not only engaging with the work, but kind of in, engaging with the world, you know, uh, uh, I think. Yeah. See, I'm not even too sure myself. Yeah. Yeah. Bring a friend <clears throat> to see the show before it comes down. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the great thing about allies is to be prepared to have the conversation. Sometimes the most, <coughs> sometimes the most difficult conversation to have is with family. Yeah. It may not see or appreciate or respect <coughs> an alternative history of Australia. <coughs> the, the harsh realities of the situation Aboriginal people find ourselves in today. <coughs> Closing the gap reports factually state that every year. And um, yeah, I'm just engaging with, with you know, great art. Yeah, that just yeah, 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 just to, to add be able to, to have that conversation, I think is important. Yeah, that, that's probably the easiest way that I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, just to add to that, like, see, one of the things uh, as an artist is, especially at this place here and other art institutions, is that they always ask artists to talk about their work, and um, you know, and that lines up with talking to people about things, the more you talk about something, yeah. you know, the more clarity will come yeah. uh, as well. And, and it's like, you know, in the studio up in Brisbane where I work, uh, it's like an old paint factory and there's lots of other artists there. And at any given time, um, without notice, you know, the developer and Josh Milani or curators will come there and, you know, and we'll just yarn and, you know, like, I just talk, and as it turned out, it's almost automatic. I say the same things over and over and over again, but each time in saying that, it changes, and I get a bit, little bit more clarity yeah. over something. So, you know, it's kind of the more exposure to whatever it is, yeah, yeah I think the more it benefits uh, yourself, but also us as well. Yeah. Yeah. Frank? I was fortunate to be in Germany some years ago for Documenta and oh, wow. privileged to see your work there. And I was just wondering what that experience was like, you know, having your work showcased um, you know, for many different artists from around the world. Mm. And, you know, it would have been quite um, intense, I imagine, a conversation. What was that experience like? Oh, it, it was, um, look, to be, well, well Documenta, I mean, it, they, they often refer to it as being, you know, the Olympics of the arts, even though artists were non-competitive and all that. Well, it's longer because it's only held every five years. Yeah, every five years <laughs> a, a, as well, sort of thing. Because the Olympics comes around every four years. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and the thing about that, you know, like it was good to be, be treated so well as an artist and respected and and you know looked after and you know the the staff and everyone over there was almost at our beck and call um as well um and you know which is sort of totally different to this country uh, with its respects to artists but you know for me personally um what was really interesting is you know the work that was in documenta that was selected for documenta is that one there that one, uh, murray land one that was over in germany and, um, and the way that it came about was that was like a commission from a show that was curated by this uh, curator, Vivian Zahurl, and the show was called Frontier Imaginaires. So I was commissioned to do work about 
the history of Queensland from an Aboriginal perspective um, in relation to this work by this Congo artist called Shibumba, who Shibumba painted the history of the Congo. And as you know, the you know, well, history in Congo was quite brutal mm. uh, by King Leopold. But um, so that was kind of like the template for me to paint Murrayland. And, um, and, and as it turned out, you know, like Vivian Zahurl is really good with this curator, really good friends with this curator called Fred, Fred um, Hendrik Fockerts, who is, uh, he happened to be a curator of Documenta. Mm. And um, Vivian showed the work to Hendrik, but who, uh, who is, who has a little bit of a, you know, a history bent. And he, she reckoned he just lit up and he wanted the work in Documenta. So that was magnificent, you know, that mm. uh, that, that work went to Documenta. Yeah. And the wonderful thing was, I was the little old artist who had done it. Mm. So, yeah, so I kind of like, you know, was kind of like tagged along with it. I was its kind of like um, accessory, I guess, sort of mm. thing. <laughs> yeah, so the work was selected, not me, right? So that was the good thing about it, you know, is that the work is the star and not necessarily the artist. And it's like, that's what I like. That's how it should be, I reckon. I don't even think the curators should be the star, even though they selected the work. But, but like, and the easiest thing about it was is that the work was there, but all these other artists that were selected, like, uh, like there are certain themes and certain uh, uh, um, visual and conceptual threads that all the artists that were selected to, uh, for Documenta had to read like every six, three months they would send like a booklet called South about the thinking of all the artists that are supposed to create work for Documenta. You know, there's probably over 100 artists yeah. or something. So and they were in the process of creating art, but I didn't have to because mine was created mm. uh, as well. So, you know, that was one good thing is that, um, that yeah, yeah, that, that my work got there on its own terms mm. and I just had to do more work that through when I got there because they gave me such a big wall and that was the big wall painting that, that went up and then also as it turned out Documenta also stretched into um, Athens as well yeah. and then I had to do another wall painting and a mural there so so uh, I, I didn't completely get away from mm. you know work there as well but it was quite uh, amusing that that at any given time when I went over, like the travel budget was quite good. I was backwards and forwards. I think I traveled the most, you know, in, in my life in such a short space of time mm. from, from Athens to Castle. And um, there was always artists over there, you know, mm. racing around, like uh, uh, trying to get things and do things and working with, you know, arts workers to clarify what they're supposed to do. Whereas, you know, I was kind of sorted out. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, was, it was a chance for me to have a good time and, you know, to savour the delights of the Mediterranean and then, mm. then also, you know, engage in Castle and Germany uh, as well. But yeah, for me, the, the experience was magnificent. But what it had also had told me, like, um, you know, the different approaches, uh, you know, to art and artists. And it's like, I felt, you know, to put it in rugby league terms, I felt that over there, I was playing A grade. Mm. But then I come back, and in this country, I'm only good enough to play maybe A, B, C, D, E, F, maybe G grade or something mm. here, you know? Um, thus, you know, the difference in attitude, and I suppose it's the difference to the concepts and ideas and the sort of work that I do here as well, you know, um, as well, yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Frank. One, maybe one last question, if there is. I have a question. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if it is a question, um, but um, Gordon, thank you for the, um, the, the, talk, the talk and the exhibition so powerful. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I was, yeah, I'm not sure if it's a question or if I've kind of answered it in my head, but um, is there a particular audience in mind when you're creating work? Um, um, yeah, I, I, anyway, that's, I just, hmm. 
I don't actually think of anyone, you know, once creating because, you know, like my attitude is sometimes, you know, the work just creates itself. Uh, I mean, concepts that I happen, they happen at different times and there's certain stimulus yeah. and certain things that evoke or provoke, you know, the start that plant the seed or the genesis to the start of the work, you know? And generally those concepts and ideas will lie in my visual diary or, or a bit of paper, tissue paper, or the back of a receipt or something because they come anywhere in any time uh, as, as well. Mm. And, and I think, you know, like the strength of the idea and the concept determines more about the work than, than you know, who's gonna see it. Mm. Because, uh, you know, in the end, basically, uh, uh, once the studio, once the work leaves the studio, I don't even know if anyone is looking at it or where it is, and mm. and you know, like, you know, I don't want to sound apathetic, but basically, I kind of don't care, you know. Once mm. the the work leave the studio, like, I don't even like. I hate it when gallerists and curators ask me to help them assemble or or put the work up, you know, mm. or, or come in. Oh, we're hanging. Do you want to come and have a look and see if this is all right and stuff like that? I don't like that because. <laughs> I'd done my job, you know? <laughs> my job was to do the artwork. It's done, it's out of the studio, yeah. it's finished. I'm too busy moving on to the next yeah. one. And then, you know, and Josh Milani, my gallerist, know that very well. The work goes to the gallery and I don't care what he does with it. I don't care if he edits the work or some does not fit on the wall with the, the conceptual thread. I mean, and, um, Jose tried to do that to me here, you know? And I'm just like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I just went and looked what he's doing and is this all right, is that all right, is that okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. I just didn't want to involve because, you know, I mean, I can understand the idea is that, look, yeah, yeah. it's my representation, they're representing me and, you know, they mean, they want to do it in the best possible way, you know, but it's like, he's the curator. He gets paid to curate, to put the works up. <laughs> and all I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm like the art store. I give him the variables that mm. he, or she can play with in the gallery, you know? Well, I mean, look, the curator's gonna have fun as well, you know? And, and I've just seen them in action when they want stuff to go anywhere, and it's like, yeah. they move into the zone too, and it's like, it's, a de uh, it's art making, in a sense, to them, yeah. to put works up that fits with a, uh, um, a conceptual thread or... A rationale. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I don't want to interfere with that, you know? Mm. They don't come into the studio and interfere with my painting mm. uh, as well. And it's a bit like um, writers um, who come in interviews when they come and do an essay of you. Yeah. And they interview you and, like, you know, they're, they're talking to you and you ask the question and I'm talking away and then, you know, and then they go away and they do the, uh, the periodical or the article for the magazine or for the book or the, or the catalogue, you know. And then next minute they'll ring you, um, uh, you got an email, can I send you a hard copy of this and you can have a look and see if that's all right, this is all right. I'm like, no, no, I don't want to read it. As long as you put your name to it, yeah. that's okay, you know. Yeah. Because in the end, like, you know, um, that's what they do. Yeah. And when they put their name to it, it's their mm. work, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, basically, they can write and say anything they want, basically, uh, about my work or about me or whatever. But in the end, while their name is there, mm. it says more about them, actually, than it mm. does about me. Mm. And, and so, you know, like, when the work leaves the studio or when I'm working there, um, whoever sees it is far from my creative process or, or, or thinking, you know, um, as well, because I'm responding to the stimuli or, or the concepts or ideas that started that art in the first place or, or whatever. And it varies according to different works, be it sculpture, painting or printing, or if I'm working with a technician or something and doing new media work as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Does that answer your question? Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Did you find that poem? <coughs> you did. How are we going, Kip? Good? Did, did you want, you want that poem to be read out? What's that? <coughs> that poem. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Um, where's the young lady? You've got your poem? I do. Oh, I've got, yeah. Poem, yes. We've got a beautiful poem about to happen here. I, I just thought it'd be lovely to finish, finish the on panel this note. Yeah, I think it's magnificent. With a current student. Yeah. Oh, well done. Of Kofa. 
The laws would be co for me. You want to start out in design to maybe. Did you want to come up the front? Yeah, so it's coming from all of us old fellows to a, a younger artist. Yeah. <laughs> well, I should speak to myself, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so the, major class? The class, yeah, it's a, it's a core subject. It's Indigenous art now, and it, we came and saw Gordon Hookie's work oh, in the, the very first week, actually, is where we had our first class. And after class, um, we spent some time um, on country just... We had a little bit of a chat and then our task was to do some deep listening and we all created something that was related to our practice and I'm, I like to write a lot Jeez. and was very affected by, um, by the exhibition and it came up in what I wrote, so if you're okay for sharing so it. So I mingled one with the, the palm was on hand and... Voila, it happened. <coughs> yeah. So you were able to print it out, was it? Yeah, yeah. I was able to quickly write it down. I had a recording of it randomly on my phone. I went, oh, I'll quickly write it down and um, share it. So I'll share it with you now. And I close my eyes to make time slow down. I can hear better now, feel better now. I feel the mosquitoes biting my ankles, and I'm annoyed at first. They've always loved something about my blood. But it makes me think about what SJ said about this being a wetland before it was a city. The mosquitoes must love it here. And it's true that it's difficult to block out the traffic, but it's a little easier with my hands planted in the grass. I'm thinking about how soil is alive. I'm thinking about mycelium and the way that it connects the trees around me. I'm thinking about the dirt under my nails and in my shoes and on my backpack. For a minute, I swear I feel a heartbeat. It's probably my own, but maybe it's not. I'm thinking about how it would feel to be the dirt I'm lying on, a hand digging into my side. And I can't shake the memory from this morning. Going down to the garage and noticing two swastikas on a water pipe that runs beneath my apartment. I've lived here for four months now. How did I not notice before? I brought down some cleaning products, whatever I could find, and tried to scrub them off. Orange power, eucalyptus oil, easy off BAM, nothing worked. I googled what gets rid of permanent marker to find that rubbing alcohol may be my best bet. I'll get some on the way home from uni. I resolve that if all else fails, I'll head to Bunnings on Wednesday and get some paint. But it doesn't feel right to cover it up. It's still going to be there. Drip. And in Gordon Hookie's practice, the swastika is coded into his paintings as a marker of histories that can't be scrubbed away or painted over. The microaggressions that reveal themselves on the cuffs of perpetrators' wrists are the microaggressions that exist in my garage. They're the microaggressions that smother this city, this society, this country, this country. Drip. And tonight I'll go to sleep with the knowledge that below me, in the room beneath my room, Hatred and aggression and violence will mark their territory. Drip. And I pull myself back a little to this moment, this place, the way the grass sounds when my skin meets its blades, my hand in the dirt and the dirt in my hand and the earth that's holding us both up. And it reminds me that when you dig deeper, underneath the anger, underneath my bedroom, underneath the garage, there's dirt. There's land, and it's bigger than us. And tomorrow when I see the lumps on my skin from the mosquito bites, I think I might be fond of them. They won't be itchy anymore. They'll be raised reminders of the time that I spent here, in the grass, digging a little deeper than before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I just want to thank you all for being such an amazing audience. I'm also very happy we've got a bit of sunshine in the four-day rain we are expecting, so says the weatherman. Um, but again, I just wanted to you know, thank God for coming down, thank Catherine and the UNSW Art and Design staff. The exhibition looks absolutely amazing. You've done an incredible job. Um, I commend everyone that's um, contributed to the installation and the ongoing programming of, of the show. Please get out and tell your friends. Um, tweet it. 
I'm not on any of this media. Facebook it. However you get your message out, um, you know, this is a show that must be seen. Um, Gord, you're an absolute legend. Um, as an alumni of UNSW College of Fine Arts, <laughs> um, you're an artist that I've, I've looked up to. Um, you know, we've, uh, we haven't done too bad, actually, in terms of... <laughs> the, I'm just thinking of all the other artists that have come through here that, have, yeah. that are kicking goals. Yeah. Um, you know, we're... We're holding our own. We're in good company. Keep We're holding our own. Yeah. Um, but I think you know what's more important is those conversations that you're able to have with people, um, you know, that are visiting this space, seeing the work for the first time. Um, the inspiration that comes from discussions you, you have with with you know the, the fellow members of the proper now, but you know mm. colleagues and, and family. Yeah. Um, long may that continue. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you know, you're an incredibly... The, the persona of Gordon <laughs> is completely different to the persona of his artwork. <clears throat> and, and that's what I love about your practice. Like, <laughs> I, I think of Richard and the persona of his work matches up with, the, with him. You'd you think he'd done this work. <laughs> <laughs> well, well the, the public Richard that everyone yeah. knows, but we all know, yeah. the, the, you know the, the humble Richard that you know, we get to see yeah. behind closed doors. But um, you let your art do the talking. You know, and it and it like that ripple in the water, it it, yeah. it expands and it crosses not just geographies um, and postcodes, but um, you know, it, it reaches places that I think you know these conversations are really important to continue having. Yeah. Um, and you know, I commend you know the thirty year practice that's you know brought about the exhibition and um you yeah, look forward to you know the next work yeah um <laughs> and I, yeah I'd, you know i'd just like to ask all of our audience to please put your hands together and thank everyone thank you thank you